Yes, um, I was just saying that um, when you talk to the average African farmer, um, they can see that there are different um, indications um, that um, the climate is changing. Um, for instance, if they enjoyed uh, three to four months of rain in a year, um, that's becoming shorter. They can see that it's now probably raining for two months. Um, they can also see that um, they're having to adapt to a whole set of complex changes, you know, um, and that sometimes they have to deal with um, things related to crop failure. Uh, they have to deal with um, frequent floods, for instance. Um, they have to deal with um, droughts um, as well. Um, and so all of those things that are happening, uh, making life a little bit more complicated for them. Um, and they have to make decisions. Um, one, one of our research partners said to me that for the average African farmer, um, he has to make about 30 decisions in a month about what to plant, when to plant, under what conditions. So I think, yes, in terms of awareness, um, you know, we can see that definitely the African farmer is today um, better equipped with knowledge um, and has definite um, signs and indications that um, they can use um, to see how things are changing and, and how it's changing at a very fast and alarming rate. I see that as a foundation, that if you want to really help farmers, you have to understand how the knowledge that they have is helping them, in a small way even. Um, so I don't think that we as researchers can come and superimpose our views, that we have to find ways of ensuring that we understand the indigenous knowledge that they have, the local knowledge they, they have, as part of that foundation building. Okay. Um, so. I would say that in many of the projects that we are seeing, um, that indigenous knowledge is coming a long way to helping farmers. But I think we need to also realize that our ind indigenous knowledge is fast disappearing. You know, we need to find a way of optimizing the knowledge. And optimizing the knowledge would mean that we have to find ways of making sure that traditional knowledge is you know, sort of connecting with some of the scientific knowledge that we're seeing. But I think what would be great um, is for us to find, um, for us to get to a situation, I'd say, whereby we're not just supplying that knowledge to farmers, but we're responding to, to their demand. Mm -hmm. I think it would be great if um, farmers can come to us as researchers and say, I have this particular problem on crop failure. I have this particular problem on issues around locust control, you know, or in terms of water conservation management. Um, and what am I supposed to do? How am I going to address the problem? And that based on that demand, we can actually produce with them the kind of solutions that they're looking for. But I think when we're constantly on the supply factor, we fail to take into account how the knowledge and the information that we are producing is really being used, how it's being applied um, within the different contexts. So I think we need to find ways of basically working more from a demand perspective rather than from that sort of push supply perspective. So I think communication is an essential component. Um, but I think also that the whole aspect of institution is important. What we tend to see um, and see very often is that projects start, they have a start date and an end date. Um, and when they do end, the knowledge often is lost. Um, and communities are left to go back to the same old sort of coping mechanisms to continue with what they were doing. But I think we don't necessarily need to create new institutions. We have to identify the institutions that are there, that are providing or have some parts of the answers, some parts of the solutions, and see how we can build those institutions so that they, they, they're part of that legacy. Um, and they continue to support communities when the projects are not there anymore. 
So I think institutions are fundamentally important, you know, in framing adaptation, in thinking about how adaptation could be validated, um, in measuring what adaptation looks like, and basically in putting their own collective thinking about what adaptation should look like. I think the local national level is the hub, that's where the action starts and therefore you cannot sort of divorce adaptation from that sort of hub. Um, I think that's where everything comes together but I think the implications are much broader so therefore you can't just leave it to a local national level. But I think the challenge that we're faced with now is how do we scale out a lot of the good results that we're seeing from one village, you know, from one region to another? Um, and this is where a global framework, I think, would be useful. Um, having some set of a standardized way of looking at what constitutes successful adaptation.